Hey DJ, just play that song. Keep on scratching all night. Hey DJ, just play that song. You have me itching all night. For the next ten weeks, we will discuss a different element of hip hop culture. Uh, those elements being the DJ, the MC, breaking, graffiti art, street knowledge, beatboxing, street fashion, street language, and street entrepreneurialism. For the first time, we will bring experts to discuss and define each element of hip hop culture. talking about entrepreneurialism. show thank you uh for being with us we're in uh week 10 of our series hip-hop beyond rap and uh we're talking about street entrepreneurialism how to make the money today and uh today our first guest uh has more than uh, 20 years in the business uh he has been a creative visionary uh he has been producing hits in in music and in film he has been influencing culture and he has an uncanny sensibility of what's hot he has many gold, platinum, and multi-platinum albums and singles to his name. He's a bona fide hit maker in rap, R&B, and pop, and film and television. Uh, he earned his first gold record at the age of 16, and he has produced some of hip-hop's most classic hits, uh, including hits with Ice Cube, LL Cool J, Tupac, and many others. Uh, QD3, welcome to the Keep Tucker Show. Man, pleasure being here, man. And I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea what you're doing, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, listen, man, um, I just wanted to uh, um, let our audience know a little bit about you. You know, you've been in the scene for so many years. Uh, you started out as a break dancer, huh? Yeah, I started out as a break dancer, man, um, back in like 82. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ended up going on tour and being a professional break dancer, and then um, when I know realized that you know you can only dance for so long in your life, you right? Know, it's kind of a young man sport. Yeah. Um, I, I started looking at what the DJ was doing, and I kind of fell in love with the whole technology side of of hip hop, meaning like the drum machines and and all the samplers and that stuff. So I, I ventured into a production from there, but right. like fourteen or something. Right. And, uh, you, you actually had uh, uh, your first hit in uh, 86, uh, Next Time, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, So, because uh, I was doing a little research, man. And so you were born in uh, in Sweden, right? I was born in London. And London. then I, I moved to L.A. for about three years. And then when my parents got divorced, um, I moved to Sweden. Okay. And I just want to let everybody know this is uh, Quincy Jones' son, QD3. So. Oh, 
Yep. So everyone knows that. Um, so once you uh, made your first hit, I, I, I think you moved to uh, New York after that, right? And did you uh, start on uh, producing after that? Yeah, well, I, I was producing in Sweden. And then um, what happened is everybody was saying that hip hop was going to end in a couple years, you know, because breakdancing was just a fad and, and the MCs hadn't really gained traction yet. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to go to New York to kind of catch the, the tail end of hip hop. And, and my mission was to come to New York, work with one or two like relatively known rappers and then come back home and get a day job and call it a day. Gotcha. And it ended up kind of taking on its own life. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you were in New York, you worked with uh, uh, Rakim, Karis, One, Tila Rock, too, and a few other people, right? Yeah, it was amazing because as some as a hip hop fan from Sweden, you know, you don't have the same kind of access, really. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> when I moved to New York, what happened was is Tila Rock came out to Sweden and he stayed at my pad. He said, "If you ever come to New York, you know, you can stay with me." I don't think he meant it, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I, we plopped down, me and my mom's moved to New York, and I was like, I'm here, and I ended up being roommates with Tila Rock, and his brother was Special K from the Treacherous Three. Right. So um, it was like the perfect landing pad to, to, to get like into the real hip-hop scene. We yeah. walk around on the block, we were staying in the South Bronx at the time, mm -hmm. and you know, you go to the liquor store, Melly Mel would be right there on the corner, you know what I mean? Right, right. So it was amazing. Yeah, so you really got to experience like the, the creation of of, of hip hop before some of these uh, artists started getting big. I mean, it was bananas. Like we'd be in the studio um, in New York at a place called Power Play, mm -hmm. and um, Eric B and Rakim were there before they had dropped anything, you know. And um, I remember seeing them record Microphone Fiend. Oh wow! And KRS was there working on his second album. And when we were in the Bronx, there was this little eight track studio around the corner from our spot. Mm -hmm. where he did uh, Criminal Minded. So I definitely was privy to a lot of really unique, formative years in hip-hop, you know? Definitely. Now, did you go to the uh, Berkeley School of Music while you were uh, in New York, or wh where was that at? Well, this, this actually um, falls into the topic we're about to discuss, because I went to Berkeley for about eight months, mm -hmm. and, you know, I was itching to get to work. So I was there for about eight months and learned some real basic, you know, music harmony and, and like the rudiments of music theory. Yes. And then um, you know, I just got the itch and moved back down to New York from Boston and started just producing with Tila Rock and some other cats. And then I eventually moved to L.A. where things actually took off. So Right. So and that's right into the subject. So th is that how you got your start as a hip hop entrepreneur? And when you went out to L.A., did you have like a plan in mind from the things that you learned in New York? And what was your plan when you went to L.A., man? I mean, it's an interesting story how I got into it. And it's probably contrary to what people may believe, given who my father is. Right. But uh, what happened is my parents, when they got a divorce, my mother didn't really press the issue on taking him to court or anything like that. So we ended up. Um, moving back to Sweden mm -hmm. with no real settlement or anything like that. And um, we ended up in public housing. Oh, uh, okay. And, you know, I had a single mom who had a substance abuse problem. Mm -hmm. So she was, like, real lenient in terms of my lifestyle because she was relatively free with hers. Right. So um, she basically said, you know, if you don't go to school, I don't care whether you do or not, but you got to go out and do something. Mm -hmm. So that's where I really got it from. And she was like, go out and make it happen. So I... Ended up leaving school in 10th grade and going on a breakdance tour. And from that day on, I've made a, a nice amount of money since 16 years old, you know, just um, through hip-hop. Right. And you... then when I came to America, like mm -hmm. I said, I was really here to catch the tail end of hip-hop. And then I was going to come back and get a job. So I think the plans were implemented once I got here. <laughs> right, right. So, so once you were in L.A., uh, what was the first job that you had out there? Uh, the first job I had when I came to L.A., um, I hooked up with this guy named Crazy Tunes, and he was the brother of a rapper named Dub C from the West Side Connection. Oh, okay, yeah. And we started working together, and um, and that was similar to the Tila Rock experience in that they were like the founders of, of L.A. hip-hop in some ways. It was before N.W.A. really took off. Right. So um, I, I started working with him and his brother, and we started producing acts, and one of the acts was a female rapper that got signed to Eazy -E and Dre's label right before NWA really took off. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, basically under Dre's camp for about a year and a half, two years during that time from like 86 to 88 or 89 or something like that. Okay, okay. That's, that's how I got into the L.A. scene and that's where I met Dre and, and Cube and all of them. And then when uh, NWA fell apart, um, me and Ice Cube basically left together. 
And did, did you guys go out to New York with the Bomb Squad and all of that? Um, or how did that come apart? You know what? I was here for the L.A. part of that album. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so that's how I hooked up with Ice Cube is, is through that experience. And yeah. It was amazing. I mean, seeing Dre working, you know, before he had really made it. And, you know, Jerry Heller and Easy. and Yo, this is Big Daddy Kane. This is Dick Gregory. This is Cheyenne Salaw. This is Dr. Maxine Nim. This is Elmer Dixon. And yes, y'all, this is Melly Bell. This is the Indigenous Fly Girl. Yo, this is Johnny Deuce. This is Big M1, one half of Dad Friends. This is Elf Yo. This is Paradise. This is QD3. This is your girl, Miss Tracy. This is Tony Muhammad. Yo, this is KRS-One. And you checking out the Keith Tucker Show. Hey, bow down. Hey, bow down. 